if you're a journalist who writes daily on the European Union. You look at it from a microscopic point of view and you see the difficulties, you see the frustrations, you see how complicated it is to unify, to get people using 23 official languages working together. If you step back a bit and if you look at what we've done over the last 50 years, it is absolutely phenomenal in my view. And Maastricht was a milestone in that development. For much of the 1970s and the early part of the 1980s, the European community was gripped by an institutional affliction that came to be called Eurosclerosis. The European economy was performing relatively poorly. Member states argued interminably about the budget. There was little political direction. But around the middle of the 1980s, the European community suddenly began to take on a new sense of purpose and ambition. And out of this renewal came the Maastricht Treaty a new blueprint for European integration. As a former diplomat from Luxembourg who helped draft much of what became the Maastricht Treaty and now as a senior official in the Council of Ministers, Jim Close has a broad historical perspective. He takes up the story. I think before the Maastricht Treaty you had the Single European Act in 1985, which was the first major reform of the European treaties since the Rome Treaties. Uh, you had the arrival of Jacques Delors in '85 at the Commission, which also was an important moment. He uh, was going to be a great president. And at the same time, you had the enlargement negotiations with Portugal and Spain, which actually were giving a boost to uh, the European Union, like very often happens with enlargements. Uh, and lastly, but quite importantly, the economy was picking up. However, even by the end of the 1980s, the European community was still essentially an intergovernmental organisation, dominated by personalities such as François Mitterrand, Helmut Kohl and Margaret Thatcher. But the world was changing rapidly. The end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union had raised the prospect of a truly united Europe. But the challenges facing Europe were growing all the time. So it was clear that the European community needed radical change and that change was Maastricht. But Maastricht was not just a reaction to changing circumstances. It also represented the growing influence of the European Commission as an independent power base led by its inspirational president, Jacques Delors. He was adamant that Europe was so much more than just a collection of member states. It was an ideal, a vision, and one that couldn't just be left to national governments to achieve. It was against this backdrop that the Maastricht Treaty emerged. Let's have a look at the changes the treaty brought in. Firstly, Maastricht created the European Union as the umbrella framework for European cooperation. The treaty then created three separate ways of working, known in the jargon as pillars. The first pillar was known as the Community Pillar, which covered a range of economic, social and environmental policy areas. It was here that the European Commission and the European Parliament had more power and influence. The remaining two pillars focused on foreign, security and defence matters and also justice and home affairs policies. These pillars were the exclusive preserve of member states. The Maastricht Treaty was a compromise between those member states who wanted to go faster towards political integration and those who wanted to slow down the momentum in this direction. But perhaps the most significant aspect of the Maastricht Treaty was economic and it was the natural consequence of having created the single market a few years earlier. The River Rhine marks the border between France and Germany, two countries that for centuries had been rivals and often bitter enemies. By the early 1990s, however, they were partners and their economies were well integrated. Together they were the motor of European integration. But the democratic transformation across our continent injected a new sense of ambition into the leaders of the European community. And the success of the single market revived a very simple but very profound idea. Economic and monetary union with a single currency at its heart. The concept of economic and monetary union was nothing new when the Maastricht Treaty was signed, but it had been shelved during the long years of Eurosclerosis. However, by the mid-1980s, the European Parliament was holding regular discussions about the idea. 
Karl von Vogau served as a German MEP for 30 years and was the EPP Group's spokesman on economic and monetary union. I think we, we started a, a debate about uh, monetary union in 84, 85, uh, so, something like that. And we gave good examples uh, why uh, it was a very uh, a weakness uh, of the European economy uh, that we didn't have a common currency. We gave little examples, uh, like for example, if somebody was traveling uh, around Europe and changing money from border to border, and uh, in the end, after 10 countries, he wouldn't have anything left because uh, the, the changing uh, of the money uh, took so much, uh, so, so much time. And uh, that uh, we argued that uh, it was very important for the competitiveness uh, in relation uh, to an economy like the United States, uh, economy. We, we did develop these arguments uh, and uh, I think that had a certain influence. Ruud Lubbers was the Prime Minister of the Netherlands from 1982 to 1993. He was also the President in office of the Council of Ministers during the latter part of 1991 when the Netherlands held the Presidency of the Council, which gave him the crucial job of chairing the summit in Maastricht at which the final details of a new treaty would hopefully be negotiated. It was in Maastricht that the rule book of the Euro was agreed, the so-called convergence criteria that member states would have to fulfil to show they were ready to join a single currency area stretching from the Arctic to the Aegean. This rule book had four basic elements. Firstly, prospective Eurozone members had to keep a tight lid on inflation. Then there were strict rules about limits on the annual deficits and overall debt that member states were allowed to accumulate. Third, would-be members had to join the exchange rate mechanism for at least two years and they were prohibited from devaluing their currency. Finally, nominal long-term interest rates had to be held down. But rules are only as strong as those who promise to keep them. And from Ruud Lubbers' perspective, a failure by some member states to stick to these rules is directly responsible for the debt crisis afflicting some member states today. You need discipline which worked very well in the 90s of last century. And then at some point, exactly those two large partners, Germany and France, started to erode the two of them together, the discipline. And then the others thought, hey, yeah, possibilities. And some of the problems of today are related to becoming undisciplined at the end of the 90s. The flip side, you might say, of the discipline of Maastricht was the lack of discipline seven, eight years later because the financial world started to say you can earn money by this, this is great. So this became business and it became later on a disaster. So does that mean Maastricht could actually be considered a failure in this respect? No, the other way around. Maastricht is the last moment that there was discipline. It, it went on for five years. It had a a, a real good function in many countries who want to become member of the euro. So there was a honeymoon of roughly speaking seven years from Maastricht 1991 till say 97, 98. He then took over the financial innovations in the world. Financial markets becoming not only surfacing the real economy but earning money out of that. This is what you call casino capitalism. Casino capitalism is the opposite of Maastricht. And later on, one suggested that the problem started in Maastricht. No, it started with there was also companies who advised countries like Greece to, to, to do tricks in their accounting, etc. So there is a real problem in modernity. But we are talking now Maastricht. Maastricht is an example of discipline. 20 years on from Maastricht, EU leaders are once again attempting to impose the discipline of the Maastricht criteria. Member states have signed up to new mechanisms designed to promote greater supervision of each other's national budgets. It's part of a wider thrust towards European economic governance, which is as much a political instrument as an economic one. In fact, many experts have long lamented the fact that economic and monetary union has not been accompanied, at least until now, by the same level of political integration. Yeah, I think that that's today the main weakness. Uh, of uh, monetary union as it stands to, today because at the time uh, we said uh, and that was especially also uh, an opinion of Helmut Kohl, he said we are doing monetary union 
But at the same time, we have to do political union. But what happened was that we had a full-fledged uh, monetary union in the end with a central bank, a common currency, uh, everything you need. Uh, but uh, but uh, we don't have a, a political union until now. And I think the fact that we don't have a full political union in the European Union, uh, that's the main weakness of the system. The Maastricht Treaty has since been replaced by the Lisbon Treaty. But given the current economic difficulties that some member states are experiencing, the ideas and principles of economic and monetary union set out in the Maastricht Treaty are as relevant today as they were 20 years ago. However, Maastricht should be remembered for the right reasons. It was in this room that the leaders of 12 European countries gathered to make history. In February 1992, just two months after they agreed the treaty, they signed it. And so the European Union was born. Since then, the EU has evolved dramatically. 15 new countries have joined, and the summit's crowning achievement, economic and monetary union, has given us the euro, an everyday reality across much of our continent. In fact, you could even say that Maastricht is the birthplace of the euro, which is why it's such an important milestone in our common European story. I think it's an um, incredible pro uh, progress. Uh, and when we started to work on this in 84, 85, it was difficult to imagine uh, how things would look, uh, look afterwards. Because I think uh, the fact that uh, in all the Euro countries, we now have a common currency, that every citizen has the same coins in his, uh, in his pocket, it is also a, a, terrible, a terribly strong symbol of, uh, of unity.